For decades, David Attenborough has brought the wonders of the natural world to millions of people. He's written, produced and presented dozens of documentaries from around the world, resulting in some of the most memorable moments in TV history. They're so similar. Their sight, their hearing, their sense of smell are so similar to ours that we see the world in the same way as they do. So David is now 93, his message on the environment resonating with young people. This great festival has gone plastic free. What's it like for you to connect so strongly with the younger generation? I have yet to meet a kid who is not absolutely riveted by the natural world in this city. Wow, and their eyes come out on stalks. And they're right, you know, it is extraordinary, it is fabulous. Uh, and it is a source of delight and pleasure and humour and, and adventure and so on. Sir David's landmark 1979 series, Life on Earth, was watched by an estimated 500 million people and brought him up close and personal with Australia's unique wildlife. They said it was a hoax. Uh, bits and pieces of different creatures rather crudely sewn together. But it's no hoax, it's a platypus. You'll laugh just because I'm a pom, but there is nothing more extraordinary than the duckbill platypus. I mean, there really isn't. And sitting on a riverbank in uh, New South Wales somewhere or down in Victoria and seeing one of these things quietly going about its business in a pool and then coming out, I mean, it's, it, it, your eyes pop out. I mean, of course, the kangaroo, I mean, all, all those uh, big macropods, all those big marsupials, they're amazing too. I mean, they are mind-blowing. When I first started, nobody had ever seen the vision of a, a little um, neonate, a tiny little creature like a worm, come out of a female and crawl up its fur and go into the pouch. Uh, I mean, these days, we've, we've all filmed it, we've all done it. Uh, and we've all seen it, I guess, if we wanted to. But it is, that is unbelievable. Unforgettable beauty. When did you first go diving at the Great Barrier Reef? What did it look like then, and how much has it changed? I first went in the 50s, late 50s, um, and I'm a hopeless underwater swimmer. When you do it in a place like a Barrier Reef, where you have this fantastic paradise of things which, when you do it for the first time, here, here are 50 creatures that you've never seen before in your life. And all of them are fantastically beautiful, and you don't know the name of any of them. You know, and, and they aren't afraid of you. I mean, what more do you want? And you can go up and go, I'm going to have another look, you can follow them around. I, uh. I know that you went back just 10 years ago. What did you see then? Well, I mean, you go where you want, where you, what depends on what you want to see. Mm. But, um, and I wanted, I was looking for evidence of, um, of things going wrong. And we found plenty. I mean, a, a bleached reef is, is a, a tragic sight. I mean, a desperately tragic sight. Particularly if, you, if you've seen it before, you know, uh, and you know what it could have been like. And you just see this acre of, of deathly white, Coral. I mean, that's, that's serious. Please welcome Sir David Attenborough. Sir, you have the floor. In recent years, his advocacy for climate change has become sharper, pressing world leaders directly for the need for urgent action on climate change. We're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. I've been saying it at the same sort of level, as loudly as I can, for a long time. I've been going on about uh, global warming for at least 15 years. But there's something, there's a moment come when everything comes in the right sort of way together and suddenly you say something and bang, it makes, a, it makes an effect. And you can't predict what that's going to be. I did a, a programme called Blue Planet 2, uh, in which we showed plastic. Well, now I've been talking about plastic in the seas for, for certainly 20 years. But suddenly, everybody was motivated about plastic in the seas. Well, hooray, but, but, uh, but, it, but I've been going on about it for a long time. Nobody thought that human beings would change the climate. 
In July, Sir David singled out Australia. Australia Appearing before a UK parliamentary committee, he said we have climate deniers in government. Both Australia and America, those voices are clearly heard. Um, and one hopes that the electorate will, will actually respond to those. Australia, it seemed to me, was, was saying all the right things uh, previous governments were. Um, and that when, and uh, you are uh, keepers of an extraordinary section of the, earth, of the surface of this planet, including the Barrier Reef. And what you, do, what you say, what you do, really, really matters. And when you've been uh, upstanding and, uh, and talking what I see as the truth about what we're doing in the natural world, and then you suddenly say, no, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much coal we burn. Uh, or indeed saying, well, uh, there's a, this is the economic solution to some of our economic problems. But then go on to say, but we don't care a damn what it does to the rest of the world. What do you say? Our Prime Minister in his former role as Treasurer brought a, a lump of coal into the Parliament. He oh. said it was a joke, but a lot of people didn't see it as a very I didn't, funny. I didn't think it was a joke. And if you weren't opening a coal mine, okay, I would agree, it's a joke. <laughs> but you are opening a coal mine. Well, that was a very big issue in our recent election, the Adani coal mine. And um, the voters in Queensland swung towards opening the coal mine rather than taking strong action on climate change. Um, to me, that says the job of taking people with you on climate change is, is very hard as a politician. How do you think they can do that better? Fundamentally, uh, in the end, you, you have to appeal to, to what people I think are right. But some people are, uh, are very worried about, I guess, the immediate things in their lives. So how do we you know, convince people who, who are worried about putting food on the table or getting a job um, that they should somehow make sacrifices for the long term and, and for the planet? It's a problem, certainly. But the, but the fact of the matter is that the world is going to be running short of food. Seriously, for short of food. And we are going to have to change our feeding habits, our eating habits, um, because it won't be there. Of course, you and I, we're very lucky. I mean, we're living on uh, high on the hog. You know, we are very privileged people. And there are an awful lot of people in the world who aren't. And, and as climate change happens to them and their harvests fail, you know, there are, there's a real danger that we, there's going to be starvation over uh, and famine. And that is now becoming a global problem. Young people have heard the message. Now millions of students around the world, including here in Australia, are demanding leaders do more. Young people see things very clearly and they are speaking very clearly to the politicians. They may not yet be old enough to have the vote, but they see things about it and it's their world. It's not my world or even your world. It's their world that's coming along and it's their world that's going to be uh, in hazard. And, and they want to make it clear to the politicians that they know that. Um, and, uh, and if they just sit on the sidelines and, and say that in a nice, reasonable way, you know, <laughs> the kids are oh, kids. But if they actually do something in the way that they have been doing, in this area, then politicians have to sit up and, and, and take notice. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! We've got to convince every part of, of civilization, of our societies, that you have to go that way, and, and convince bankers and big business that actually, in the end, the long-term uh, uh, future lies in being having a healthy planet. And that if, unless we do something about it, big business is going to suffer. You know, you're going to lose your money. OK, one of the other movements that seems to be starting is um, flight shaming. Do you think we should stop flying? Well, I haven't stopped flying. I would hesitate to, to travel a long way for a purely trivial purpose. Uh, but if I'm travelling to do something well, to make a program about climate change. I think that's justified. It doesn't seem like you're slowing down. You're still doing so much um, for someone in their 90s. How do you do it? I, I, luck is the answer. You've got to have luck. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably lucky. In all honesty, it's not me. It's what I bring with me. That is to say, great shots of the natural world. 
in, in my experience anyway. And if you see some of these fabulous sites, I mean, wonderful waterfalls or coral reefs or birds of paradise displaying or something, you know, that, that's something, that's real, and that's, that's our world, you know. And I've had the luck of um, introducing that sort of vision for 70 years. I mean, it's just unbelievable, really.